It's all good. So I can put it on my uh, that YouTube live on Facebook page fortune and when we once we go up live go to your phone and you can share this over to your personal page or uh whatever All right, let's see here. All right, you ready? Yep, I'm good. <coughs> oh, that's Corona. I got Cat Max it's over here next to me. Hey, baby. So, when do you travel again next? Um, uh, supposed to be Wednesday. I'm not supposed to say that out loud, though. You just got me in trouble. But I think uh, I've got like a little short three hour in office consult on Wednesday next week, but I'm pretty sure we're going to, I'm pretty sure we're going to move that. I'm just kind of trying to plan it by ear right now. I know she's shut down. Everybody else is shut down too. Yeah. Okay. So we got that going and then I'm going to share this over to my personal page. Get that part going. And then we'll jump into this thing. I'm kind of glad we're doing this because I um I don't get we don't get to talk often enough. And no. by, <laughs> and by doing this Hey, it's kind of like if we're going to have a conversation, we need to schedule it. So this is scheduled and B this way I can record it. So, uh, when I get lonely, I got somebody, I can go back and watch this. It's like, I'm talking to somebody. Just like the good old days. I know, right? Before you got married and started having kids <laughs> left me behind. How are, uh, speaking of kids, how are they, how are they handling this with school being out? I talked to Kinsley for a little bit last night. She was like pretty excited about it. <laughs> she, and, uh, <clears throat> she was pretty excited about it. <clears throat> but her, and, her and Chase have been out of school. How are they, how are they handling it? They're actually, I mean, they're doing good. We don't, I mean, we don't watch the news in our house. Uh, we haven't for several years. So I, I don't get on the news unless they're occupied with something else just to kind of get updated. But this, so they, they don't know anything that's going on. Good for you. They just think it's spring break. And this is the first spring break. We haven't taken a trip. We canceled our plans, obviously. Um, but it's just like spring break for them. Yeah. They have no idea. I'm not talking to them. Chris is talking to them about what's going on outside the four walls. So it's just, you know, they're just, what they are happy about is that I'm home. So oh, we've been yeah. painting and playing games and scavenger hunts. So, I mean, 
it's, oh, they're gonna it's be so bummed. Much, they're, gonna be, they're gonna be so disappointed when you go back to work. <laughs> I know, I know, for babies. But yeah. I mean, we're we're definitely staying home and kind of following the administration's guidelines. They're they're excited, but they don't know anything. So I think it's important that I, I think it's important that we not alarm the kids when we don't have enough information. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Are they they're not asking questions about it or anything like that? Nope. Okay, good. I think that's probably, well, I, I don't know, man. They, they get on, they get on your iPad and get on YouTube. That's what I'm afraid of. Cause they're going to pull up some kind of a video on YouTube. Cause that's Chase has everywhere. mentioned COVID. What's that? Yeah. Well, Chase has mentioned COVID. He's mentioned it. Like the words have crossed his lips, but he doesn't really, he doesn't really know. And nobody really knows. So I'm not, I, I see no reason to get kids to shake kids uncertainty. They need to feel like I believe like it's just another day. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. What about Chris? Is he, is it affected his work at all? No, they're still actually working where he works. So they're still going in. There was talk that they might shut down, but they haven't as of yet. And, and as of right now, there have been no cases in coffee County. Right. Yeah, there, there, we haven't had any cases in Coffee County, Bedford County, Moore County, Franklin County, whole Tri County area. We haven't had anything yet. That doesn't mean it's not here. It just means uh, I don't know if they're testing for it here. That's the challenge. Is it's it's kind of like the governor Billy came out and said that you know we're going to see the cases sharply increase over the next two or three days because now they're testing for it more. So you really don't know how much is here or in an area. And if you look at the worldwide statistics you see where the u.s is as far as how it ranks with all the other countries and it's it's way behind china it's way behind italy that's kind of like uh neck and neck with france but our our um cases and deaths per one million people is more comparable to the countries way down at the bottom of the list you know what i mean that have don't have that have like a couple hundred cases so I don't know, man. I, I, I made the mistake of, of uh, I was just bored. I made the mistake of getting into some of these Facebook groups and reading some of the comments. And I took the bait yesterday and I, I commented on a post, man. And I got absolutely just my head chopped off. Apparently I, was on the wrong, <laughs> apparently I was on the wrong side of the fence when I made my comment, but I was just like, man, basically where I was coming from is it was, they were attacking Trump, you know, and uh, about a comment that he made, because you know how he interacts with the, with the reporters, reporters bait, kind of bait him. You know, they ask him, they ask him questions and say, and, and they they make very suggestive types of uh, comments. They they know it's going to irritate him and get under his skin, and they know he's going to react to it because it's just. I mean, let's face it, it's Trump, and uh, people are people, and just get attacking. I'm like, man, y'all got to quit turning this into a, a red, a, a red and blue, you know, or a, a right and left issue man it, it's just golly these guys came out it was i could tell they were trying to pull me in to get me to get me in a debate with them because it was the same three or four people commented on my comment like seven or eight times a piece like 15 yeah. minutes would go by the comment again they were trying to get me in there to to get in this back and forth and i was like dude i got better things to do <laughs> you know, agree to disagree just accept that i have a difference of opinion right that's okay you can disagree with me maybe i'm wrong you know yeah. But it was uh, it's bad, man. That's I think that's the thing that that scares me more than anything else is you. And I guess it's what you pay attention to because I see a lot of good stuff taking place in, on social media too. I see a lot of positive stuff out there too. And maybe I've just been focusing on the negative stuff, but man, I see a lot of stuff where people are turning this into a political a political back and forth, and it's it's you see a lot of just anger. And hate, and I hate to even bring this up because I know that there will be people that disagree with this. But obviously, there were some, there are some DSOs, there are some other healthcare professions, optometry, chiropractic. There are some other verticals of healthcare and private practices that have decided to stay open so far. They haven't closed yet. And whether they're waiting for the governor to shut them down or, or whatever, but the bottom line is, is what was the the you know, regulatory agencies came out and they made this recommendation and the vast majority of people complied with the recommendation. I know all my clients have closed, right? 
and the vast majority of people have complied with the recommendation. They're doing what is quote unquote socially, the socially responsible thing to do. But the handful of people that chose not to do that, that are uh, uh, choosing to stay open, I guess, until they're forced to shut down, man, there is so much social backlash. I mean, they're getting absolutely attacked and I've seen some stuff that just, it, it, it I don't really know what opinion to draw on it. Cause at this point, I don't necessarily agree with it. I don't necessarily disagree with it. It's not my place to judge it. Um, because everybody's entire, I don't run that business. It's not my place to tell you, you know, you're wrong for staying open. I don't know what conversations he's had with his employees. And, you know, maybe his employee said, if, if you close down and we don't get a paycheck, we're all going bankrupt. You know what I mean? So maybe it's not him being selfish. Maybe it's him trying to protect his team or his patients, or maybe in the area that he's at, there's no documented cases. You know, I, I don't know the variables, but I see some people just really attacking these guys, man. And it's kind of like, man just why can't we just accept the fact that that maybe just maybe i'm not right about everything obviously i'm entitled to my opinion and i can express that but to do it in a way that undermines or criticizes or condemns somebody man i have a hard time with that and well and here's the thing right now i mean you and i know the six human needs Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, looking at the basic, the most basic of the six human needs is the need for certainty. Mm -hmm. And when certainty has been shaken, when people, and there is no certainty right now, anywhere. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. They don't know how much longer the shutdown is going to last. But when uh, us as human beings, when our certainty is tested, that's when we default to behaviors that we feel will give us certainty back, right? So people who are angry people, they're going to get angry. People who, you know, are self-preservationists, they're going to just take care of themselves, you know, but everyone's going to have a different response here. And it's not what's right or wrong. It's just understanding that people have lost their certainty. Mm -hmm. And they're going to clamor to try to find that wherever they can. Yeah. And I thought it was really cool because we're just coming off of one of our session fours where we walk through that discovery process and the six areas of certainty, right? The, the basic areas, our environment. Well, we have no certainty in our environment right now. Right. Right. So then it talks up to our behaviors, now our behavior is limited because we're confined to our homes. So then it chalks up to, and this is what I thought was great about Jennifer and Yolanda's. Um, and it chalks up to, okay, well, what do I really believe is important? And what do I really believe is valuable about what I'm doing right now or what I do in general. And then we go through the identity and the capabilities and all that kind of stuff. And so right now people are clamoring for the low hanging fruit. That's going to give them certainty, like hoarding toilet paper. They can control yeah. how much toilet paper they have. Yeah. And so they're kind of cleaning the shelves off. Or what do you think that, I guess this is my question. What do you think the emotions are that human beings turn to? Cause you see, some people, and everybody's different, but some people you see are just coming from a place of abundance and gratitude. I know we were planning to do like a volunteer day in Nashville, and then we got kind of shut down, you know, to help with the tornado stuff. And then the social distancing thing came out, kind of, you know, but other people are coming from a place of anger. You know what I mean? What do you think determines what emotion I operate from when I'm searching for certainty? I know when I went through, you remember this years and years ago when I separated from FedEx and I came over to fortune and I was in a very, very difficult financial place. Um, and I made it mean all the wrong things. Right. So I took, I took a bad five minutes and I milked it for two years. <laughs> right. Right. And, uh, you know, I just, I was, it was the way I was focusing on it. And the questions that I was asking myself, it was just kind of a downward spiral. And I was sunk into like a deep depression. And I mean, looking back on it, man, I should have been over that in a day, take a day, deal with it. And then, you know, move on. And, uh, it, it really slowed me down and looking, looking at going through that period now until now I would, I would handle that so much differently. 
but I can remember what I reverted to back then when I was that person. And I feel like I'm a much different person now, but you know, I remember what I've reverted to anger and I reverted to like sadness and hopelessness and helplessness. And that's what, that's what I went to, you know, what do you think determines? Cause I, cause then that's where I went to here. I go, I'm like in a completely different place. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty going on now. I don't know what the next one, two, three months is going to look like, but I, I, my approach to it is significantly different than what it was back then. What do you, what do you think determines where they operate from? Honestly. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in an overriding philosophy of, are you the victim? So no matter what happens, you're the victim in the game. This is happening to you. The, the government's doing this to you. COVID-19 is doing this to you. Is your philosophy the victim philosophy? Or do you take on the philosophy of the victor? I can be fine. We're going to make it through this. We've been through this before. I mean, even in our lifetimes, we've been Great. We've been through. We've been through the 2008 recession. That we've seen before, and again, the uncertainty that is being bred through the news outlets, the mm -hmm. uncertainty of how long the shutdown is going to last, the shelter in place is going to last. You know. When, when people don't have that certainty, that's when they make, a lot of times we tend to make poor decisions, yeah. whatever that is, right? We just don't always make the, the best decisions when our certainty is shaken. But over, over, I guess my overriding thing is those that claim the victim mentality, they're going to be the victims in this situation. Mm -hmm. Those that are you know, that, that they're resilient, they're emotionally resilient, they're going to choose the victor's path, which is what's, what could be good about this? Where's the opportunity in this? And I don't mean that disrespectfully at all. I just mean, because I, I had the victim mentality for a long time and I get it. You know, when you're doing everything you know you can do and you think you're playing by the rules and you're doing everything right, why do some things happen? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know why some things happen, but what I do know is that, you know, the human spirit is strong. And if we choose class, taking care of each other. And I think there's something to be said about the, the mindset behind self-preservation and herd preservation. You know, right you now when that, people you mentioned are that yesterday. Yeah. yeah, I get the concept right. of it. I don't know that I've ever heard that before. So right now when people are scared and they're filtered and, and they're, they're uncertain, some people are defaulting to, I've got to take care of myself. That gives them the sense of control. It gives them a sense of certainty that I may not be able to control this, but at least I can take care of myself and I can make sure that I've got enough food mm -hmm. to last me for two weeks. There are other people that are focusing on herd preservation, focusing on how can we get through this together? together. You know, where can I help? I mean, I'm, I'm relatively healthy. I don't, while, while I may not be afraid of this, I recognize others are, what can I do for them? And the herd mentality, the herd preservation, I feel like is what will get all of us through this. You know, I mean, you may make it, but if you make it alone, mm -hmm. what purpose did it serve? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's, it's, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but this is, you know, um, it's a dialogue that I've had with myself and I, this is kind of the, the filter I put it through. Um, but I, you know, one of the things I believe is that, you know, if you believe it's right or you believe it's wrong, the, there's just as much information out there that says it's right as there is information that says it's wrong. There's just as much information that says the Republican party has it all figured out as there is the democratic party has it all figured out. And I don't necessarily believe either one of them are accurate. I don't think that, I don't think that you have the truth and I don't think that I have the truth. I think the truth is somewhere between the two of us. And the only way we're going to find out what that is, is for us to have a discussion about it. 
right? Yeah. And for me to understand and appreciate and respect where you're coming from and for you to, to, to give me the same. And so if there's just as much information out there that says we're in a bad, you know, really bad time and I need to, you know, uh, serve myself and, you know, all that kind of stuff, as there is information that says the opposite, it really boils down to what question I ask myself. Would you agree with that? Because both of the, you can't have, you can't Absolutely. have, true, you can't have true without false. Those two things come into existence simultaneously. So how I behave is really going to be a reflection of what question I ask myself, which is going to direct me to one of these two pieces of information. What's wrong with the world? Why is this bad? How is this going to affect me financially? How is this going to affect my family? That has me focused on all the one side of the equation. But if I ask, how can I you know, still be productive while my practice is shut down or my business is shut down? How can I still make sure my employees are taken care of? How can I still make sure my patients, if I'm asking those kinds of questions, it directs my attention to the other side of the equation, which is going to translate into, you know, the place that I operate from. Am I, you know, self-preserving or herd preserving? Is that, is that kind of on the same wavelength? Yeah. I mean, because right now every country is going through this. This isn't just the United States. So this is not a political conversation. And those that are making it such you know, we, we might agree to disagree, but this is not a Democrat Republican conversation. Right. This is a worldwide conversation. This right. is about our humanity. Yeah. And how do we show up when this kind of stuff is going on? And there's got to, you and I were talking the other day about, you know, the, the catabolic emotions versus the anabolic emotions. And there's a lot of things that we can be doing personally personally to take care of ourselves so that if we are carriers, then we can repair our immune systems and, and get back to, you know, vibrant health and, and have the virus, you know, leave our bodies or whatever. But, and, and the news is doing nothing but fueling some of the the, the anger, the blame, all of that stuff. So you've got to be really careful, I believe, about what you choose to watch right now because our immune systems are either strengthened or weakened by how we feel moment to moment. Oh, that's good. And so what we're paying attention to right now is either creating a weaker immune system or a stronger immune system. Yeah. So how are we caring for that? What, you know, what, what are we doing to self-manage and to, to not just self-manage our physiology, but to self-manage what we're paying attention to, what we're letting mm -hmm. kind of seep in. Yeah. That's why the... I mean, the kids know nothing about what's going on. Right. Because these are adult problems that kids don't need to take on. They don't need to take on that fear. Mm -hmm. No, they don't need to take on that that just, I, I mean, fear and uncertainty, we're their parents. We need to be the ones that provide them certainty right now. And they don't need to know, you know, what's going on out there. But if we're not managing ourselves, then that will ultimately bleed over into them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sandra Hassan posted a great post on Facebook the other day. It said, uh, your, your, every cell in your body is eavesdropping on your thoughts right now. Yes. And I was like, dude, that's deep. That's so true. You know, because they can, I mean, they can determine at autopsy based on the site specific cancers that we manifest in our body, what thoughts, you know, what, what, what emotions we experience most often, man. And that's a, I know some people, I know when I first, right. heard it, I was like, dude, this is a bunch of, you know, hoorah kind of stuff. But then I, I drank the Kool-Aid and I took the bait and I was like, then I really started to understand it and appreciate that message and how accurate it is because it, it's 100% true. And that's, we were talking about power versus force the other day. And that's, that's a big challenge with where we are right now because there's so much animosity and so much negative, but the, the, I can't remember how you phrased it, but the, the frequency level of, somebody who is coming from a positive place is exponentially greater than the frequency of somebody who is, you know, depressed or sad or, 
doom and gloom. And so you don't need everybody to really be uplifted and optimistic and, you know, and, and positive about the situation. You need a handful to offset the balance, you know, because one, po like one positive person is equal yeah. to 20 negative people, you know, but if you can get more and more people to come for more, place, yeah. Exponentially, right. Or it's more because it's exponentially more powerful, mm -hmm. right? Those, uh, you know, just thinking positive, getting your certainty back. Where are you finding your certainty and how are you reinforcing that? The energy behind those types of emotions is exponentially greater mm -hmm. than the energy of fear or lack or apathy or depression or, you know, any of those mindsets that the news would propagate for most of us. And one, but the more people, the merrier, but we really don't need that many. It's really just a select few who choose what they're going to focus on and how they're going to feel right now to counterbalance all the other things. Mm -hmm. And this is true for the virus too, right? Because, well, going back to power versus force, right? I tend to geek out, you know, this virus started somewhere and there is a cure for it somewhere just the thought of a cure means that the cure exists, Correct. right? Correct. So just continuing to focusing on that, focusing on how the economy is going to recover, focusing on going back to work a few weeks from now, if we have enough people focusing in that direction, it's not going to be long before the tide turns. Right. But you've got to be selective about what you pay attention to right now. Yeah. Now you're I, not, just to, just to clarify, just to clarify, you're not saying that the, that the cure in its totality, like exists in a vial in a lab and it's being hoarded. What you're saying is the, whatever the formula of components is that constructs the cure, that formula exists. We just may not have discovered it yet. Exactly. Cause if you think about it in order for the virus to exist, the antidote has to, too. Bingo. Yeah. Right. Because they, they can't exist in a vacuum right. for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. Basically, Basic, physic, basic law of physics, right? right? So that means that for this virus to exist, its antidote has to too. Mm -hmm. So question for you, how are you? To. Yeah, this is something I'm concerned about because obviously I, I want to, you know, go see mom and dad, uh, but I've, I've traveled, you know, and I, I'm asymptomatic, but that doesn't mean that I'm not infected. You know what right. I mean? Because I haven't been tested. Uh, what do you do about that? Do you go see them or do you just stay away until the thing's over? I'm, you know, I'm not sure how to handle that. Well, mom was here on Thursday, I guess it's Saturday. So mom was here Thursday cause I had calls and she was watching the kids cause Miss Sue's been sick. Yeah. Uh, and Miss Sue is in that high risk category as well. Uh, right. Uh, so both our parents and you know, Miss Sue. And so, you know, mom was here, but I washed my hands frequently. I made, I mean, all of our surfaces have been sanitized, but my thing is I'm basically letting mom and Jessica off for the next week yeah. uh, to work from home, do what they can, but to not, because I've been traveling too, yeah. but just in the event I'm a carrier, because I, I don't get you know, I think I'm a carrier anyway, um, but I don't get sick, but I do want to make sure because Jessica's got a, you know, compromised immune system. Mom is in the high risk. Dad's in high risk. So you have been limiting contact. I still talk to him, but I'm he not going to go he see him me. right now. He worries me more than anything because I don't, as stubborn as he is, I don't care if it was a bomb dropped in Tullahoma tomorrow, he's going to be at the studio at 6 a.m. <laughs> doing, doing what he does. <laughs> There's no, he's going to be up and down the road. There's going to be no stopping him. You know, so it's kind of like, how do you, you know, and, and growing up with this, there's almost, you can do, there's practically nothing you can do to keep that man from working. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, is he, is he still going to be running around doing his thing? That's a strong belief system though. I mean, what's really stronger? I mean, what, what has a bigger impact on our overall physiological 
psychological health? Is it what we encounter outside these walls or is it emotional fitness? Is it mental fitness? And there's a lot of science that says emotional and mental fitness trumps everything. Yeah, believe, so the, you the may come in contact with it. it. The belief that you're not going to contract it is in itself its own vaccine to an extent. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Like I've tested positive for the flu before and had symptoms. Yeah. No, I just don't get sick. I've held yeah. that belief for 20 years. I don't get sick. Right. And so I tend not to get sick in this particular scenario. I may be a carrier. I may be a host. And so I'm going to do my part to make sure that I don't infect others who may not have the same belief system. Right. But yeah, I never get sick. Right. Yeah, and I had this. I've had this. <laughs> Man, I had it, I just don't. I had it so, turned out ear infection when I came back from Mexico. You remember how my ears wouldn't pop? Uh, right. And my sinuses started getting backed up, and then my throat started getting sore, and then I started getting this stuff in my chest. Uh, well, it turned out it was an ear infection, and so I've been on antibiotics for my ear infection. But and I, the people that I talked to about an ear infection, apparently you're supposed to feel really bad when you have an ear infection. <laughs> And I was like, I feel fine. I'm still going to the gym. <laughs> I'm still doing what I do. I, although it's just irritating that I got to either blow my nose every 10 minutes or I can't breathe through my nose. It was, that, that was the only irritating part. But then the, the thing in my chest kind of hung with me for like three or four weeks. And then this coronavirus came out and I would cough and everybody would turn and look. <laughs> I was like, it's, not, it's, you know, ear infection. That's what I have to tell everybody. <laughs> 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 And so, and so I'm still, I've still got a very little bit of it there. I finished my antibiotics yesterday, but, um, but no, I totally get that. I think I got the flu last year and I didn't, I didn't feel bad. And the people that I told had a flu, they're like, Oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, why are you sorry? They're like, Oh, cause you know, we know how bad you feel. I was like, I don't really feel bad. I feel fine. I'm still traveling. I'm still work. I'm still running around, you know, and it just didn't, I don't know. I'm the same way. I've never really, you know, I've, I've never really been impacted on the same, to the same degree. And I, I'm, I would have to, the only thing that I can chalk that up to is a, you know, I'll I work out, eat healthy, that kind of stuff. That's maybe part of it. But B, you know, um, I mean, psychology, that's the only other thing I could, I could potentially chalk it up to. So I got a question here. Help. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, did you say you had a question? Yeah, I got a question in, our, in the feed here. I wanted to throw out there. Okay. Well, go ahead and read the question. All right. Um, question is, what is the best advice for dentists right now who are dealing with staff on unemployment, office shutdown, and bills that need to be paid? I've got some thoughts on that. I know you do too. And chances are we're going to have the same opinion on this. So I'll let you, I'll let you go first. So I would say the first thing is understand that as the owner, you are the leader and your number one responsibility is to give your team certainty, which I know is hard right now because we don't know what the next couple of weeks is going to bring, but your team needs to know that you will be there. And as soon as you're able to open back up, you will and that their jobs will be there. Mm -hmm. They need, your team needs certainty from you right now more than anything else. They just need to know that when, and I think most team members understand, I mean, several businesses are having to shut down, which means a cash flow crunch over the ne next couple of weeks, but yeah. they just need to know at the moment I can be gainfully employed, am I still gonna have a job? Mm -hmm. And so again, we've been through recessions, we've been through stock market crashes, we've been through natural disasters, We've been through a lot of stuff and we've always bounced back. Yeah. I see no reason why it wouldn't be the same now. Yeah, we've been through, I mean, as a, as a, as a people, I mean, you look at the Spanish flu, killed 30 million people. You look at SARS, you look at MERS. SARS was, was uh, five times, and I don't even think the mortality rate of this thing is accurate because they don't know how many cases there are. Right. So I think when it's all in the wall right now, it's like 4%, right? 
right? Well, SARS was 20%. It was, one point, it was, it was actually 0.14% as of the numbers this morning. That may okay. have changed. But in the U.S., and I'm talking about within the U.S., based on the number of confirmed cases and the number of deaths, oh, yeah. it's 0.14%. Oh, yeah. It's a lot lower in the U.S. than it is globally. Globally, it's like I, last time, a couple times I checked, it was like 4%. U.S. the cases the the deaths that are occurring due to the virus are much significantly lower as a percentage. Um, probably has something to do with our healthcare system, you know. So, I guess. But uh, um, SARS was you know five times deadlier than this thing. MERS was like the mortality rate was like a third. Like if you there's one in three chance you died if you contracted that. Um, went through you know the whole the whole you know. Uh, 9-11, um, like you said, natural disasters locally, Katrina, you know, I mean, there's just, there's a ton of stuff that happened and we're still kicking. I mean, worst case scenario, we, 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 we might be in a, a, a compromised financial spot for a period of time, which I don't think that that's going to be the case. We'll talk about what that looks like, but you know, it, it's just, it's, I think it's more the fear of the unknown than, than what it will be in reality. Right. And it was kind of like when I went through, you know, that many years ago, that's the worst part of it was I didn't know. I didn't know when I was going to get income. I didn't know when I was going to be able to, to pay bills. I, I, I didn't know there was, there was, it was uncertain. And looking back on it now, man, if I would have just been like, it turned out okay. I mean, it was hard. You know, I didn't like sleeping in my truck, but I mean, you do what you got to do. Um, and I mean, you, you make it through. So I don't, I mean, we're resilient, man. Uh, there, there's, it, it's going to take a, a hell of a something serious, you know, to get us down and keep us down. You know, I don't, I don't think there's too much out there that's going to, that's going to set us back that, that much, you know? Um, and I think for, for those people who have been through difficult times like that, I think they may look at this thing a little differently, you know, because they've been that I know, I remember when, when, when you early in your career, I mean, when you were scratching by, you know, I know what that looks like and I know what you went through um, professionally, you know, with with um, Fortune of Tennessee and just that whole issue. Um, so, you know, we go through hard times and we make it through and then we come out on the other side. But today the sun's going to come up tomorrow and uh, we're just we're going to keep on keeping on. So and that's a great thing. You know, when all this is said and done. One of the one of the things that I think is great about all this, well, a few things, but one of those things is I think it's gonna show us just how resilient we are. Yeah. And that we're much tougher than we give ourselves credit for a lot of times. And that there's a lot of crap we can take before it just you know, and it doesn't kill us. It yeah. doesn't destroy us. We can take a lot and yeah. still bounce back. And I think the other thing that's great about this is that it's an opportunity to kind of get your, you know, kind of take a look at your financial house and have I been, you know, we teach in wealth mastery, spend less than you earn, right? Live beneath your means so that you have enough to put into savings and to protect yourself. And um, everyone has a different level of income coming in, but the rules are the same for everyone, right? Live beneath your means, mm -hmm. make sure that you've got, you know, two to six months of protection for when this my clients and Chris gets laid off frequently or has in the past. And so we learned this early on in our marriage that we need to have that much protection, right? Because when we're commissioned, we don't know what our income is going to be month to month, right? It kind of fluctuates. So we're used to dealing with that uncertainty where people who are used to a steady income, they're not necessarily used to this. But what I do think is great about this is that it's going to give all of us an opportunity to kind of reassess and say, okay, do I really need X, Y, Z? Or is it, is it just something I get because it's a, it's a luxury or it's one of those things that makes me feel better, whatever it is. But I think this is a, is a real opportunity for us to kind of look at our financial house and see just how stable it is yeah. when the unexpected happens. You know, we know that 80% of people are one bad car wreck, one bad experience away from potential oh, oh. bankruptcy. And yeah. so maybe this, 
you know, and so maybe this is kind of, okay, well, let's, let's assess and see where we can get a little bit more organized, see where we can, you know, maybe save a lead little, even though it looks like we can't. Um, but I also think that these couple of weeks has been a tremendous gift because we all stay so busy yeah. all the oh, time. Totally we're agree. so busy. Yeah. And now we've all been forced to put on the brakes to kind of take a moment and so, it, you know, even though it might be a little bit inconvenient, this is a big opportunity yeah. for a lot of us. Spend time with, like you said, spend time with your kids and you travel so much. Now you got two or three weeks where you get nothing, you know, they're going to get nothing but mom, you know. Right. You know, a lot of the home projects you've got around the house that can get done. I've got a list of stuff I need business projects that get done. <laughs> that yeah, probably, clutter. I started compiling that list probably three or four years ago. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be at the, by July, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be crossing off goals that were like 2014 goal. <laughs> you completed 2020. Yeah. I got the time to do it. So, uh, so good stuff. Uh, what was it you mentioned right there? I wanted to circle back on real quick. Um, uh, what's great about this. Oh, I think this is just from my experience. I think it's going to give a lot of people a why to get their financial orders you know, in order, you know, because the vast majority of, of, I don't know about other countries, but the vast majority of, of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. They live on debt. You know, it's, it's their borrowing time, you know, it's on interest. Um, and we talked about this during session five a lot, but, and I know you mentioned that a lot of your clients said, you know, session five has, 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 has what they learned in session five has positioned them to be in a better place going through this thing than they would have been had they not been exposed to that. So I think yeah. it's great that they're able to get their hands on that information. Um, but I think this is going to give a lot of people a reason why to, to do that. A lot of people are kind of putting it off. Oh, I don't need to do it just yet. Don't need to do it just yet. And then when, when I, I know you learned this lesson when you were probably 20, you know um, when you went through, you know, all that. And then I learned it around 25 or 26 when I went through something similar. And that was my why, you know, to kind of pay to, to, to adopt a different financial philosophy. Um, and I was actually talking to a client of mine the other day um, about her friend. They just came back from a, a spear um, course in Arizona. And uh, I have so much admiration for this lady and her husband because I, I go down and I meet with them frequently and we're looking at practices to acquire and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we sit at their kitchen table and all this kind of stuff. And I love them both. They're amazing people. They live in a beautiful home, nice neighborhood. Um, you know, uh, she makes, she does very well financially. He does very well financially and they drive Toyotas, you know, like Toyota Corollas. And it's like, they freaking get it, man. It's, I mean, you don't put your money in depreciating assets. You put your money in appreciating assets. So you can look at how they've got themselves set up and you can very clearly see that they have put the biggest chunk of their money in things that grow, not things that decline. And I'm like, there's so many people that would be in their position that have more money, you know, that have more money going into things that depreciate. Like, you know, you can drive not too far from here over where I used to live and you can see like, you know, Yukons and, and, and new Tahoe sitting in the driveway at a trailer park. You know, you paid $25,000 for your house and $80,000 for your vehicle. You know, that's, that's why you're not making progress financially because you're not, you've got to adopt a different financial philosophy. And, um, I think that's significant, man. So when you, when you see it and you see people operate that way, like you, for example, Looking at the way you and Chris have set yourselves up, you see the same thing. You're like, these people get it. They're not buying brand new hundred thousand dollar cars. You know, they they've they, they're living below their means. They're living modestly, and they're the people that are going to be in a much better position going through something like this. So I think for a lot of people, this is going to be a scary enough experience that they're going to say, "Man, something's got to change." And then coming out of this, they'll make some adjustments. And then they'll position themselves a little bit better so that next time something like this rolls around, they're prepared. Right. And I think, again, right now, no one knows what the future holds. No one knows what's going to happen in the next couple of 
weeks, you know, our clients are calling asking, you know, what if they extend the shutdown for another week or two? Well, if they do, they do. You know, we can't control what comes down from the administration. All we can control is what we choose to focus on. All we can control is how we choose to leverage this time. And all we can control is how we choose to take care of ourselves and how we choose to take care of each other. And one of the things that came up on a, a client call earlier this week was really about, you know, during this time when, you know, I think it was a, I don't know where the quote came from, but you'll remember this. It, it said a, a true judge of a man's character is not wh where he stands in times of comfort but where he stands in times of adversity. Mm -hmm. And right now we're all facing a lot of adversity and uncertainty in how we choose to show up oh, it's so good. in line at the grocery store. Yeah. You know, how we choose to show up. Are we, are we ransacking the grocery store just to take care of ourselves? Because yeah. all of those karmic deposits either create debt or they create surplus. And so I think it's important for all of us to remember how we behave right now. Yeah. To get our own certainty and what we are creating as our future by the choices we make right yeah. now. Yeah. There are some people that, that I obviously I pay attention to on social media and they're, they're, uh, they're people that are in positions of influence, right? They have a, they have a fairly large following and, and I, some of these guys I have a lot of respect for, you know, I pay attention to them. I listen to their words and I think they, I think they, they, um, at least they portray a very positive, very proactive position. Um, and then some of the stuff that I've seen coming from those folks over the last few weeks, you know, I'm like, man, I expected, I expected, it's almost, you're a little disappointed almost. You're like, ah, man, I expected better from you. Um, some of those people, you know, I, this is exactly what I expected. I wouldn't have expected anything other from you. And, other folks is kind of like, man, I just, I don't know, man. It's just, it's, uh, I think you'll look back on this and say, I think you'll look back on this and say, man, I wish I'd have handled that a little differently. I wish I'd have spun a different message. So, okay, cool. Uh, got another question coming in. So we'll make sure we get into these things. So as far as, is dentists, uh, dealing with staff unemployment, um, office shutdowns, bills that need to be paid. Uh, I'll run through these real quick and you can tell me, you know, if any, if, any of these are off or if you've got anything to add to this, a loan deferment, uh, the dentists and their employees need to be getting loan deferment on any and all loans that they have. If you've got practice loans through bank of America, they've, I've got confirmation that they're deferring up to 90 days and it's very easy. You call them, I need deferment 90 days. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, federal student loans, there's an automatic deferment without interest penalty, without interest, uh, for 60 days and the feds going to extend that if they need to. And to my understanding, that's not, not something you have to go in and apply for. That's something that is automatic. Um, so I need to look into that myself because I still have a little bit of student loan money out there. Um, I would also say business interruption insurance. Uh, if you're a small business owner, dental practice, whatever, um, if, you have, uh, if you have business interruption insurance, and I would certainly look in to see if you've got coverage in the event of national disaster. Um, I would also look into, depending on which state you're in, I would look into SBA disaster relief loans. Uh, they're very low cost, low interest, low cost loans that you can get to um, pay for, uh, pay your staff, uh, pay your lab bill, pay any, you know, routine expenses that are coming up that you're not able to defer. Um, so, so for example, I'm looking into that as well. Just because if you've got, you know, a little bit of money on an Amex or whatever, you know, I think, I think one way to look at this that a lot of people aren't looking at it is the opportunistic side of this equation. Because more millionaires were made during the Great Depression and Great Recession than any other period of time in history. You know, so I think it's Warren Buffett says to buy at the peak of pessimism and sell at the peak of euphoria. So now's the time to be, you know, building. John Templeton. Yeah, now's the time to be, yeah. Um, now's the time to be, you know, looking for the opportunities. And I had a client call me the other day. He goes, man, I don't know what this is going to look like over the next few days. And I, I don't want to capitalize on somebody else's misfortune, you know, but I want to make sure that, that I'm in a position when this thing washes out, that in the event that people, 
but that there are practices that go up for sale that I'm in a position to capitalize on these, right? And there, and I've been in some of these Facebook forums where there are people talking about that. Yeah, that's probably where I'm going to be. A media dent closed its doors. I saw that. It's it's, it's gone. Um, and so I think there will be some of that. Yeah. But uh, so I would I would certainly suggest all those things. SBA uh, disaster relief loans. Those loans can be used for whatever you know purpose you see fit. You just go on to USA dot TN.gov, I think you can just Google SBA disaster relief loan um, and you'll pull it up. I've been in there and looked at it. Um, I would also say for dentists, there's a concept called, um, called teledentistry. And it's a fairly new concept. I never knew that the word exists, but there are a couple of insurance billable codes uh, that are available. I, I think they're like 99, 95, 99, 96. I don't have a, fee schedule or a NDAS report in front of me. So I can't tell you what those two codes stand for. Uh, but essentially what they are designed for is they are billable codes to a patient's insurance plan in the event that you talk to them over the phone, whether the doctor communicates with the patient over the phone and provides them guidance regarding some dental related need, or if a team member talks to a patient over the phone and provides them guidance regarding a dental related need. So you, it's insurance dependent. Some insurances will reimburse you for it. Some won't. So you can choose to file their insurance. If their insurance covers it, great. If their insurance doesn't, you know, um, you know, do print your walkout statement and then just let the patient know, send it to the patient, just right hand, right down on the bottom. This one's on me. Uh, this is on the house, smiley face or whatever, just kind of a good gesture. Um, I would also say, I think this is a great opportunity to, uh, to build, build relationship, you know, with your patients, uh, or with your customers. If they can't, if you're physically closed and they can't come in and they're routine customers, um, this is a great time, not to call them to reactivate treatment, not to call them to reactivate hygiene, not to call them because you need something from them. You need to collect money, call them to check on them, call them to say, Hey, we're thinking about you. Just don't send them a text. I mean, you can, uh, you can send them an email, but I think a verbal, touch with every person saying, Hey, I'm thinking about you. Just want to know, just want to make sure your family's okay. You guys are taken care of. We're here for you. If you need us. Um, I think that goes a long, long way. I think it goes a very long way. I think the same thing is appropriate with your employees, you know, be, being, being connected with your employees during the interim, you know, whether you're, we're going to be doing a lot of these. I'm going to be doing a lot of CE uh, type events to provide, you know, continued education opportunities while we're shut down. So we can, you know, focus on working on the business while we're not working in the business. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of that stuff over the next couple of weeks. So whether it, whether it's connecting with your team so that you can do some strategic planning and that kind of stuff or do performance reviews, you know, while you're down the thing that you never, the stuff you never have time to do, right? Um, if you're going paperless, now's a great time to go into the office and get everything scanned and in the computer, right? If, if you need to go in and identify, I think that's a, a good thing for us to collaborate on and create basically a list, like the top 100 things you can do to be productive during the shutdown, right? Um, you can go ahead and schedule your social media posts out for the next, you know, <coughs> there is a ton of stuff that you can do during this period of time that I think will a be productive and b help you to be more for more efficient and still make sure stuff gets done when you, when you kick back up and get running again. Um, yeah. Catch up on your book, check, catch up on your podcast, check, catch up on your exercise, catch up on your decluttering, catch up on there's, I mean, there, <laughs> I love the fact that we are not supposed to leave our house for a couple of weeks because now I can get caught up on so much stuff, not just in the business, but at home. So take advantage of the time. That's the one thing we can't get back. So leverage it. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Totally agree. Any, anything else you, you think that, that dental practices or even small businesses in general, because a lot of this stuff is applicable to, you know, Tracy's Taylor's archery. You know what I mean? just small businesses in and around your community. I think a lot of these things are just as applicable to them as they are to, um, as they are to dental practices. Anything else outside of what I said you think is, is applicable? Um, you know, just something that I'll mention. And again, it's, it's just something to be mindful of moving forward. And that is 
if your business is going to be in major jeopardy after a two week shutdown, then we may want to look at the operation. But any business should be able to withstand that, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no different than if the owner went on a two week or three week vacation. And so if, if you don't believe you can survive a two week or a three week, kind of look at internal processes and internal systems and how the overall business is operating because any business should be able to withstand that, mm -hmm. really. You know, and when it's not a judgment, it's just take a look. You've got time to take a look. Just yeah. take a look and see where systems together and we will all come through this together yeah so don't put your practice up for sale tomorrow because you had a bad month we've withstood bigger storms than this mm -hmm. and it's going to be fine but you've really got to manage your own state you've got to manage what you choose to focus on and you know use this time to make your business better mm -hmm. to make it stronger to make it more resilient use this time to make yourself better and more resilient you know, and if you want some tips, reach out to us. I mean, we, we work with practices across the Southeast on stuff like this. And these are human beings too. So, you know, everything is going to be okay. But focus on taking care of each other, yeah. not just ourselves. I will say that that's one thing I'm, I'm so proud of is I don't know what your experience has been, probably very similar, but, you know, if obviously I connected with all of my practices this past week, I connected with the doctors one-on-one, -on -one, I connected with the teams and, and I, the overwhelming response that I got was that we're chill. You know, nobody was in panic. Nobody was freaking out. And I don't know if that's a Southeast thing. I don't know if that is a, I don't know what, it, what that is. Um, but uh, everybody was fairly calm. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, we'll, we'll see what this looks like. And they, that may, it may have been like, you know, a duck you know, legs 90 miles an hour under the surface and just, you know, cool as a, cool as a fan on top mm -hmm. of the surface. I don't know what, you know, maybe that was it, but um, I was really pleased with the overall, you know, uh, the overall uh, energy, you know, surrounding this thing. It was, it was, that, that's a reflection of good leadership in my opinion, you know. Um, another question that came up here. I agree. Is, um, uh, any ideas on how we can show up for friends, family outside of our immediate household and our customers, partners, if we're being responsible and adhering to social distancing? Um, one thing that I would say is this, you know, because you and I never get FaceTime, rarely ever, you know, if we're doing a training university together. But outside of that, I don't, I, we live five miles apart <laughs> and I don't ever see you. Uh, I ran into Chris the other day at Walmart and Kinsley was with him and I was in line and I think they were waiting on you and they were over here. And then, and I looked and I happened to see them and I didn't recognize them at first. I was like, Oh, that's Chris and Kinsley. As soon as Kinsley saw me, she hunky hunky, she ran over, <laughs> she ran over to me. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't, I feel so bad, man. Cause I stay running so much. I was like, I don't see them enough. Um, and I don't see Hunter and Briley nearly enough. Uh, and it's, it, 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 it's wrong of me because I make other things a higher priority and I should not do that. Uh, but I do. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that I don't like about, you know, how I operate that I want to change, but it's, um, but it's good. I think if, if, if you're, I think that's a great thing about these, you know, opportunities here is if you're not able to get the FaceTime with your, with your clients or not able to get the FaceTime with your uh, teams or customers or even friends and family, I think, I think doing these kinds of things or FaceTime, you know, um, on, um, FaceTime on Facebook, I think there's Snapchat, you know, there are resources out there that you can use, I think to, to connect and still get the FaceTime and still have the conversation and, uh, you know, the back and forth. Um, I would say. And I think, you know, one thing that I would add to that, One thing I would add to that is that when we can't get out and we can't connect with each other in person, at least 
stand guard at the gateway of your mind and your emotions because we're all part of one big universal bundle of energy. And so if we just practice mindfulness and we practice, you know, focusing on what we can contribute to, that sends a ripple out. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we may not be able to be one-on-one, -on -one, but one of the ways we can serve mankind and humanity right now is looking for what's great about this, looking for the opportunity in the midst of a crisis so that that becomes part of the universal consciousness and the universal conversation. Yeah make sense yeah it does it does so i think i think you know obviously is is being in sales and being self-employed you know a lot of times we we need to you know take time to connect with our referral partners connect with you know supply reps with patterson and and uh, dent supply Sron and all these folks uh and i man i stay moving so much that i don't i just it's hard for me to find that time to plug in and do that stuff although that stuff is extremely important so I just, this just occurred to me when Raymond asked this question is, man, that's what I really need to be focusing on over the next few months, over the next few weeks. Say, so, Hey man, let's jump on a zoom call. Let's have a conversation. Let's connect. Let's, let's get our ducks in a row and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I think this is a great opportunity. It'd be no different. I mean, we're sitting here drinking coffee, having a conversation. doesn't matter if we're doing it right here. We're doing it at Starbucks in Marietta, Georgia. We're, we're, we're accomplishing the same thing, you know? So um, I'd say that was, that's one, um, I'd say another one is making sure that they know that you're there for them. Now, there may not be a lot that you can do, you know, physically. Um, but just knowing that you are there and that you're thinking about them and that you're present for them. And if there is something that can be done, if there is something that you can do for them, let them know that, that you are open to that. And I'm, you know, I, I'm going to accommodate you the best that I can. We're going to, we're going to share in this thing together. You're not going through this alone. I'm going to go through this with, with every one of my clients. You know, I'm right there beside them every step of the way. Um, and I'm willing to, uh, and I'll bend over backwards and be as absolutely flexible as I need to be to accommodate them as much, as much as possible. So that's kind of the hard thing is you do want to help. And you want to be you there. Out. What's that? Yeah. And when you are out, when you are out and you're doing your grocery shopping as, you know, as, you know, I don't know, fluffy as this may sound or, you know, whatever. When you're out and about and do to get out and get your groceries and see, you know, part of our elderly population, I mean, they're wow. scared right now. Yeah. And this is doing more harm to them than it is virtually any other age demographic. Mm -hmm. So when you're out and you see an elderly person shopping, I mean, if you have stuff in your buggy that they're looking, just give it to them. Mm -hmm. give it to them. Put, a, put it in their buggy instead. I mean, we're not going to starve. Most of us could go 40 days without food, okay? Mm -hmm. Our elderly population is very vulnerable and it's up to, to us to make sure that they're taken care of ultimately. And I don't, I, it doesn't matter what your excuses are. I don't care what your, your story is. That is the truth. We have to take care of the most vulnerable right now. And so whatever that looks like, letting them cut in line, giving them your Lysol or your toilet paper, just, I mean, the more we give right now, the more we will reap when all this is over. Mm -hmm. So just, just look at where you can give period. So if I would say if, if nothing else, if there's, if there's not a lot that you can do, uh, if there's not a lot that you can physically do because we're a little limited, um, don't, don't do anything for them. Be there for them. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I can't, I can't do this for you. I can't, I can't, there's nothing I can do for you, but I can be for you. And I can be here for you to, to have your back, to support you. We can have a conversation. I can help walk you through, you know, coach you, consult you, whatever that looks like, but I can be present, you know, in our relationship. Um, uh, Dr. Barnett asks, uh, and remember to come from a place of grace and kindness that people are tense and need love. So, I mean, absolutely. I think this is a, I think this is a, a big opportunity. Don't get a fight with someone at the grocery yeah. store. Yeah. I think this is a, I think this is a, a, maybe, maybe that is the whole purpose of this. You know what I mean? 
Like this is one way to look at it. Um, and I need to rewind back up real quick to comment on a previous conversation. But one way to look at this is we're, you know, we're constantly asking God for peace. You know, there'd be more love, you know, to make the world a better place to, you know, um, help me, you know, get in a better financial position, uh, to give me more time with my kids that I don't have. We're constantly asking for those things. We can't ask for that and then criticize the gift wrapping. You follow what I'm saying? So now we've got more time with our kids. Now we got more time to spend with our families. Now we got more time to get caught up on all of the business administrative stuff that needs to get done. You know, this is a great opportunity to, to challenge ourselves to come from, like he said, come from a place of, uh, of grace and kindness and gratitude. You know what I mean? Uh, use this as a reason to, to, to meet people that you haven't met before. Um, I think that's important. And I, I wanted to back up to, um, because we were talking about, you know, when we're looking at, you know, SBA. And to recognize. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, just saying, uh, we were talking a few minutes ago about, you know, not looking at this from the opportunistic side of the equation. And, you know, with SBA disaster relief, with loan deferment, and a lot of these kinds of things, the government stimulus package is supposed to be coming out. Um, with a lot of these kinds of things, some of these people, you know, are going to just imagine a scenario where, you know, I, I, def I get my, my mortgage deferred six months, but I'm back to work in four weeks and my income's back to normal in four weeks, but I don't have a mortgage payment for five more months. So now I'm taking that money and putting it in the bank six months from now, I could be in a better financial position than I am right now. You know, that's, that's very, very possible. And that, that will be the case for a lot of people, you know, but I don't think that's what, that's not the way we're looking at it. So I think maybe, you know, it's kind of like I, I, for 10 years, we tried to find a way for me to come over to fortune, you know, so that I didn't have to take a cut in income. Remember this? And, uh, and it was about every few months we'd have a conversation. It's like, hey, we're almost there. We're almost there. Got three more leads. We're almost there. And it never quite got there. And so finally, it was kind of like God was just like, well, I'm tired of waiting on you, dude. If you're not going to do it, then uh, if, you, if you're not, you know, sink or swim, you know, and he just kind of threw me into it. <laughs> and the image that comes to mind is that that meme where John Wayne walks up behind the little boy and says something. And the little boy tells him, you can't, he can't swim. And his mom's standing over here. He's like, I can't swim. And John Wayne, and the guy's like, the kid's like eight. Right? And John Wayne's like, you can't swim. And he was like, no, I can't swim. And he grabs him by his collar and his belt and throws him in the, <laughs> throws him in the water. It's like, sink or swim, dude. You got, you got to figure it out one way or the other, you know, now you have a reason why quit putting it off. So, um, so I think maybe that's, maybe that's what this is. If nothing else, maybe it's just God saying, Hey, you know, you, you, you you're asking me to, to help you be closer to your family. You're asking me for more time. You're asking me to, to help you find time to read. Here you go. You know, use it wisely. Yeah. But going back to what Dr. B said, and I, Hey, Dr. B, uh, going back to what Dr. Barnett said, I, I think if someone is rude to you at the grocery store, you have a choice not to be rude back. Correct. If someone is ugly, you have the choice not to be ugly back. That you could recognize that they're just scared, they're fearful, they don't know how to make sense of everything that's going on, and you could practice kindness even when others don't. So your our ability to love one another should not be dictated or predicated by how others are treating us right now. That is not the point. The point is how do we choose to show up? Who do we choose to be right now? Even if someone's rude or bumps into us with our buggy or hoards all of the toilet paper, we can choose not to react to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be really important right now. Yeah. That we not, we just practice love and kindness as Dr. B said. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's big. All right. We've been going for about an hour here. So I want to end this thing with a bit of a bang. <laughs> I know you're a conspiracy theorist. I am too. 
So what's your, uh, what in your opinion is the top conspiracy? I made a big mistake of watching the David Icke interview on London Real the other day. <laughs> it just, and it's just like, oh, you know, it just re reignited the flame, right? But what would you say is the, the, the top most believable, most valid conspiracy theory out there right now? Not saying you agree with it, not saying that, that not saying that this is the case, but if there were conspiracy theory that were true, which one do you think holds the most water? If, if there were a conspiracy theory that were true, um, I would say the one that is most plausible is that this is number one, a distraction to keep us from noticing things, other things that are going on behind the scenes uh -huh. and or this is this is a way to get us dependent on someone else to reinforce the victim mentality that we need someone to help us. We need someone to bail us out so that we get further removed from the power and the authority of our own lives. Same page. <laughs> Don't want to go into too much detail because you go scare people away. It's <laughs> <laughs> like so I don't want you to know how deep yeah, this thing goes. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but that's what I was saying. <laughs> I don't want anybody to know the extent of crazy that actually exists in there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like but there's I'm, a lot of stuff going on in there. A lot of stuff going on in there. But it's I'll end with that. Time. No, but that. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree. I definitely. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, and it'll all come out in the wash, but, you know, um, you know, I think, I think to a large extent, it's, it, I would say that that's the most valid argument out there, you know, is that it's a distraction. Oh, by the way, while we're <laughs> distracted, apparently, uh, Trump put prayer back in school, which I thought was pretty interesting. <laughs> so I was like, well, good job, you know, appreciate that, you know. It's usually something that I don't want to happen, like a tax yeah. increase or something like that. Gets improved while I'm focusing on this thing over here. But um, but yeah, I think that. You no, know, we have uh, to keep in mind this trillion dollar bailout. This trillion dollar bailout is going to have a ripple down effect. There is no way that there has to be a tax that follows that. Yeah. That's the only way that's going to make sense. Yeah. So there's going to be a tax that follows. So while we're focused on the trillion dollar bailout and what it's going to do for all to understand that we, the people fund the government, that we, the people are funding that trillion dollar plan. And so there, you know, again, about getting our financial houses in order, there's, there's going to be a continued tri trickle down effect. So now's a good time for us to start, you know, reorganizing and, you know, just, making some new decisions. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. And at last, the last thing I'd probably say is, man, I, whether you, whether you voted, you know, for the, if, whether you voted for the current administration or you didn't vote for the current administration, whether you voted for the previous administration or you didn't vote for the previous administration, once they're in office, man, support them, you know, don't, don't hope they fail because if they fail, you fail, you know, um, and so there, there are things that, and I wouldn't necessarily align myself with any political party, uh, per se. I have, you know, opinions that, that fall in, uh, fall, that basically fall across the board, right? More of a centrist, uh, ideology, but, um, but I'd say once they're in office, man, support them. If, if, if I could do it better, I'd be there, you know, <laughs> Every, everybody gets a lot of criticism. I know Obama got a lot of criticism, you know, from the right. Trump gets a lot of criticism from the left. But once they're there, man, the, the people collectively put that person in office and his or her administration in office, support them. You know, don't, don't, don't pray that they fail, pray that they, you know, succeed, you know, cause we're, again, we're, we're all in this thing together, you know? So I would much rather uh, whoever is in office, if there were, and, you know, if there were somebody that were more capable of handling this situation, then, then those folks, you know, those are the most talented, most educated people in the world that are collaborating on solutions about this thing. 
you know, and if there were more capable people to deal with this, then they would, they would probably be the ones doing, dealing with this, you know? So I, I trust, you know, I trust, you know, I trust our leadership, you know, to make the right decision to do based on the circumstances and what resources they have available, you know, people do the best they can with the resources they have available. I believe that they're going to do the best they can with the resources they have available, you know, and if I could do it better then I'd be trying to, to get in office, you know, so I, I trust them to do the right thing. And, and, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll continue to push forward and see this thing through. Uh, uh, really quick. Um, I just got a text from one of our clients and they were asking if this was live cause it didn't seem like any of their comments were noted. Did you see any more comments in the feed? Uh, it is live and, uh, I don't see any other comments. I had what comments, what, what comments were there? We'll address them. Um, he didn't text me what the comments were. He just said that they had been making comments, but, but did not see where they were noted. Oh yes. But yes, we will be doing a few more of these lives, um, over the next couple of weeks while we're all quarantined at home anyway. So if there are any questions that you guys would like answered or any issues you'd like addressed, then you can email them to either me or John. And on our next live, we'll be happy to address all of those. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, all the ones, all the ones that showed up on my end, I'm looking through them now, all the ones that showed up on my end, we addressed. So if there are, if there are any others out there, uh yeah dr b just put test for comments and it showed up so but yeah you, and if you got questions you don't want to put in the comments text one of us you know or dm one of us and we'll uh we'll address them so we're going to be doing a series of these things uh i'm looking forward to it because there's lots going to be changing over the next several weeks um i did see the the bill that 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 went out uh that the ada proposed to congress to include dentistry in the dental industry in the relief package, uh, the stimulus package that's coming out. Um, and this is a little scary, but uh, I, I read part of that bill and proposal included a three month um, sabbatical, a three month recommendation to, to be emergency only, you know? So uh, if that's the case, you know, we could be in this thing for a little bit longer. Um, I know the, uh, I know, uh, Governor Lee here in Tennessee, um, his stance, I watched his, his press briefing yesterday, and this is just for the state of Tennessee. I'm not sure about the surrounding states, but he's letting the, his, his stance is, is that every area is going to be affected by this thing differently. You know, Williamson County has got like 30 cases, right? And so the way that Nashville handles it is going to look different than the way that Tullahoma handles it because Tullahoma doesn't have any confirmed cases. Right. And so he's, he's allowing the individual counties and, and cities, you know, to decide at their own discretion how, you know, what their stance is going to be as far as, you know, recommending closures and that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's changing. It's unknown. But the one thing that we do know is that, uh, you know, we've been through worse. We can go through, we can go through, we can certainly make it through this thing and come out on the other side stronger and better, better versions of ourselves, better versions of our businesses and our teams you know, that we went into it. And I think that's, I think that's probably what the case is going to be. I think when we come out of this thing, we're going to be, you know, um, more resilient. I think we'll be a little bit smarter. We'll think we'll be a little bit more prepared. We'll make a little bit better decisions. And, um, and I think we'll recover and rebound. And I think we'll see a, a, a growth in dentistry and, and virtually every other business. I think we'll see a significant, you know, um, um, impact positive impact on the economy when we when we get through the other side so so anyway uh appreciate everybody tuning in um and again if you've got any questions um practice specific or whatever you know whatever you got you know shoot to myself or shoot to reagan and then we'll keep we'll keep putting these putting these things up over the next few weeks and and uh, we'll continue to press forward so uh until next time you have a great rest of your day stay safe Bye, guys. Bye, John. See ya.